Hello, everyone. It is one o'clock in the Eastern time zone of the US. And as such, we will get started. My name is Jason Govari from Cornell University. And um, I, alongside Michelle Futurnik, uh, LD4P program manager based at Stanford University, will be facilitating this session of the discovery track of the 2020 LD4 conference. Um, this is the third day of the discovery track. Uh, many of you I see in the attendee list have been attending the other two days and, and have a feeling for how this goes, but for those who have not, um, the, uh, the talk today is actually different than the past two days um, in that there will only be one speaker. Uh, Tim has graciously accepted that if anybody has any questions such as slow down, um, can you go back, uh, can you say that again? Um, things of that nature uh, that we can interrupt him in the middle of his talk. But otherwise, um, please use the Q&A feature within Zoom to post questions, which we will then ask at the end of his talk. But reminder to please, um, if you need something to be shown again, do not hesitate to, to call attention to that. This session does have a channel within Slack, as does this entire, um, a lot within the, um, the channel for this entire track. So if you look at um, LD4 2020 discovery, uh, discovery track. Uh, I would like to call attention to the links on this slide, notably the last link, um, which is for our community practice participation guidelines. By attending the session, you agree to abide by those guidelines, which are designed to ensure a safe space for all those attending. If you have witnessed activities that go counter to those guidelines, please report according to the process outlined. Uh, with that, um, I will turn this over to Tim Thompson from Yale University. Great, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Michelle. I will share my screen. Okay, so today I'll be demoing a tool called Metafactory which is an integrated solution for knowledge graph or linked data management and discovery. It's really an all-purpose tool for linked data development in general. But before I dive in, I wanted to take a moment and start with some acknowledgments and disclaimers. In terms of acknowledgments, I'd like to, to thank the members of the Linked Data for Production community and the Mellon Foundation for the support that enabled us to purchase a license for the software I'll be showing today. And I'd like to thank the members of the Yale Link Data for Production or LD4P team for their collaboration um, throughout this process. And the Metafactory team um, and technical support for answering a barrage of my questions over the last week. And since the topic of this of this uh, this demo and this the sessions this week is discovery. I'd also like to uh, again acknowledge the efforts of the LD4P Discovery Affinity Group, which has been doing important work to define standards and methods for linked data approaches to discovery, um, especially in relation to the use of knowledge cards or knowledge panels. And now a few disclaimers: the the platform I'll be presenting today is a commercial product. I'm not representing the vendor or seeking to promote the product in any way. My goal is really to talk about our experience at Yale using the Metafactory tool in the context of our work on linked data discovery at Yale in our LD4P project. I also have to acknowledge that uh, although I do work with discovery metadata, I'm neither a, a user experience expert, a designer, or a professional programmer. My aim in this demo is really to give a novice user's perspective on this software and on discovery use cases. And I, I really ask you all today to use your imagination and, <laughs> and uh, in places where my technical abilities have inevitably fallen short. Uh, I should also say that my own technical limitations may not show the full range of features of the software. So really I ask you to look at the intent and consider the possibilities and affordances of this approach to linked data discovery. Okay, so this is about discovery, but I wanna start a little bit with kind of data integration, which is another important use case that's also not unrelated to discovery. So I thought it would be kind of fun 
today um, to show a little bit about uh, one of the features of Metafactory that allows users to pull in static link data documents. So if there's not a Sparkle endpoint available, it can fetch and parse arbitrary RDF data. So I thought it would be kind of interesting if I actually created my slides using the Synopia link data editor. Many of you are probably familiar with Synopia, but if you're not, it's, a, it's the link data editor that's currently in development um, as part of the link data for production project. And it's uh, an, an agnostic, you know, vocabulary agnostic, ontology agnostic link data edit, editing platform. So I created a very simple template for a presentation and a slideshow in Synopia. And this is the resource that represents my presentation. And it contains a bunch of slides, as you can see here. Um, I should say this is really a toy example. <laughs> Don't try this at home. It's not really, uh, it's kind of a Rube Goldberg um, invention in a way, but uh, I hope it illustrates a use case. So I'm going to copy the URI for my presentation. And here in Metafactory, so one of the features Metafactory has is um, data authoring, just like Synopia, you can create forms and templates in Metafactory for data entry. You can also use create forms for discovery, um, for search. I haven't really, I won't really go into that feature beyond this, but this is just a, a very simple demo of that functionality. So I've already configured the base URI. I'm just going to strip that out. And when I click create, it should open my slides if all works well. Okay. Um, so Jason, sorry, is, is the size of the slide okay? Should I enlarge it a yes, little? Uh, I mean, it seems fine to me, okay. but uh, it's if there's a way to enlarge, I would say sure, because who knows what resolutions other people are using, but I don't, it's not a problem. Okay. So the title really of my presentation is what does linked parentheses library data discovery really look like? And I intended that to be really kind of a provocation. I don't pretend to have an answer to that question. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone. <laughs> I hope that you all have, have uh, pieces of the answer. Um, but hopefully as I, I show some of the, the features of the software, we'll get some different perspectives on maybe how to answer that question. Okay, so as you can see, if you can see at the bottom here, there's this URI which points back to the resource for this slide in Synopia. Okay, so I'll start, start with a uh, broad overview introduction to Metafactory, talk a little bit about our project at Yale, and then do a demo of some features and conclude with discussion. This is the high level systems architecture of Metafactory. I'll be focusing on the top portion really, which is targeted toward the end user. But the platform, as I mentioned, is an integrated knowledge graph management platform. So there are features for expert users who are developing ontologies. There are features for developers who are creating APIs and working with data integration. And then of course, so this all rests on top of a, a triple store backend and it can plug and play with really any, almost any triple store of your choice. The default open source option is Blaze Graph, which is what I'm using for this demonstration. So the, the vendor, the creator of Metafactory is a German startup called Metafax. It was founded by a computer scientist named Computer Haas, Peter Haas, and um, and yeah, it's been in existence since 2014, according to Wikidata. Uh, I should mention before I move on that 
just recently, uh, Medifax started a customer advisory board. And because Yale has been using the software over the last few months as part of our LD4P project, we were invited to participate. And it was really interesting to, to, to be part of that discussion. Some of their other customers are large corporations, multinational corporations. So during that meeting, there were presentations from a user at Allianz, an insurance provider, and Pfizer, um, the drug developer, pharmaceutical company. So it was interesting to hear them talk about their use cases, which are were much more internally focused for toward expert users and users who, who in, in the insurance case, who were doing fraud detection and kind of graph analytics. So one of my takeaways, I think, in general, um, which I'll note before moving on, is that it's, it's really, I think, important to have these broader discussions to understand what people are doing with linked data and RDF technology and in industry. Um, there was also a representative there from a from the cultural heritage domain, someone else um, who was working with uh, museum data and CDOC CRM. So it's really interesting to see the, the cross-disciplinary and, and really cross-industry conversations that, that linked data affords. Okay, so this is the f actually the first glimpse of one of the, the features um, built into Metafactory. This is a timeline widget. So Metafactory offers a, a series of kind of semantic widgets that a, a user without a lot of programming experience even can configure and feed a bunch of data. So I'm going to use this timeline just to kind of talk about our our project at Yale. So I start here with the creation of the, the, the company and then jump here to 2018. So Yale's LD4P2 for the second phase of the Linked Data for Production project began in September 2018 and officially concluded at the end of June 2020. Okay, so our big ticket item in our LD4P2 budget was to purchase a license for the software because we wanted to to have kind of an out-of-the-box solution for exploring discovery use cases and presenting our data. Little did we know there, there would be some obstacles along the way. Um, the procurement process for actually obtaining the license was uh, more difficult than we had expected. So it actually took several months to for, to actually get the vendor set up in our internal uh, procurement system. And we finally were able to secure the license in September of 2019. Okay, meanwhile, we're doing training in Sinopia for our metadata staff. We had a metadata team of about 20 people um, who were being trained to use Sinopia. And we were kind of, you know, tinkering with Metafactory along the way at the same time, using it for just kind of kicking the tires a little bit, but not using it in a sustained way. Um, in February 2020, at the same time that, that staff started to catalog in Sinopia, we were doing some training sessions with the vendor. So we had four staff members who were able to do training and these were all metadata staff. So two of uh, two of us were able subsequently to to work with uh, the developing some visualizations using the software. Two were not. So so we had some expertise but uh, not a lot of of staff expertise to to devote to this. And then in April, after work from home commenced, we started a, a Metafactory working group that is still in progress. So the, the work I'm presenting, demoing today is very much still in progress. Even though LD4P2 ended at the end of June, we reached out to the vendor and they granted us um, an extension for two months to our license. So 
we're still finishing, really finishing up this project and they're kind of in the, the thick of it right now. Okay, I think that's it on the timeline. As I mentioned, Metafactory exposes a set of HTML5 components, semantic components. So if you're familiar with HTML markup or XML, it's basically looks, it basically looks like that. Um, the, the names of the elements start with semantic, so semantic search, semantic graph. And this, this uh, particular component is an, a new one um, that was just released and it's called keyword type searching. So what, what you're seeing here, this is our, I've, what I've loaded into the triple store is the data that our staff at Yale produced during the month and a half that we had to create original cataloging data in Synopia. Uh, if you look, if you look in Synopia, just to jump back, you can see that, um, sorry, actually, let me start again. Well, I'll just tell you, um, we created, we cataloged 204 items. So that's basically what's in here, items. And we used a, an RDA model, so, so work, expression, manifestation, and item. So you see, so 204 items, but those corresponded to 195 works. And in the process of setting this up, I actually discovered there were some items that didn't have their full WEMI, work expression manifestation item chain, weren't part of that full chain. So this, and I'll maybe say a little bit about this later, but the process of trying to prepare your data for discovery is really integral to understanding and performing data quality analysis. Okay, so this widget, the semantic component has analyzed our data and I've, I've defined a kind of a search schema which tells it, okay, these are the categories I want you to, to parse out and to analyze. And the search schema also includes a set of relationships that can link together different uh, entity types. So this is really useful because in your data, you may have several kind of um, leaps or jumps from point A to point B. So for example, say you, you, know, you want to show all persons who have authored a work, well in BibFrame, to get to, to that relationship, you have to jump through a contribution entity which links to a, the person. So within this, this search schema that Metafactory allows you to define, you can kind of fold across those leaps in your data so that you can create direct binary links between person and work and, and you know, similar use cases. So I've embedded this widget directly into the slide. Um, and what's driving it is, is also obviously a Sparkle query, which maps onto the search profile. Okay, so en enough talking. Uh, let's see, what should I search for first? Let me click on just work and, and show you what it returns. So this display, this is just kind of a default display, but can be, certainly can be customized. Right now I'm just returning titles or access points for works, but you could choose to, to make a fuller display of the data. If I click on person, it's going to return all of the, the person entities in the data set. Organization events, we have two events place and topic. Okay, so if I go back to work, there's also with that search schema that I've defined, it also drives a set of facets or can be used to drive a set of facets. So you'll notice that work has a, an associated set of facets. 
So these are relationships that, that I've defined um, just for the work entity. So a work can have a subject and then you can, can limit your, your results for work by subject. Okay, we've got bear attacks. That sounds exciting. So that went ahead and just returned that subject. Okay, publication place. Uh, so it's already showing the publication place for that result, but you may think it's strange if you're familiar with the Ferber model that we're showing publication place for the work entity, but what this is really doing is, again, folding across the data so that it's aggregating all of the manifestations for each work and showing you where a particular work entity has been published in one form or another. Now in our data set, it's not very Ferberized, you could say. Um, there aren't a lot of there are multiple manifestations or expressions for individual works, but the, the concept should apply uh, regardless. Okay, we can also look at contributors or language. Again, this is, we're looking at work, but this is an expression level element. So, so I think one of the things I'm thinking about, and still thinking about is how to adapt our data model to really something that's more intuitive for users. And, and I don't think that the making kind of explicit this, the Ferber structure is really intuitive or necessarily helpful for users. So if, if we can find ways to kind of elide those wrinkles or those gaps, um, that seems like something worth exploring. Uh, likewise, I've gone ahead and added the, the RDA 3.3x elements uh, or their equivalent in BibFrame. So we can isolate by carrier type or content type or media type. Okay, so I've defined these facets for the work entity. I also, just as a demonstration, defined a facet for, or a relationship might be a better term, for person. So you can see all of the roles here that uh, person entities have played in this data. So mostly authors, but also printers. We have some printers here. Okay, so I like, I like this feature because I think, you know, making entities central to the search and discovery process is something that we should really think about doing more systematically. Okay, continuing with the faceted search example, this is a kind of a different approach. This is a different, actually a different component um, there are a range of semantic search components that the software provides. So this is, uh, I guess, a little more um, what we might be used, used to seeing in a faceted search environment. So if I search for the term war, uh, the first result, so what I've configured here is actually a, a map. So there's a semantic map component, which you can be embedded in a semantic search component. So this is a map of all places of publication related to the entities for that have the term war. And I'm, I'm specifically limiting this to, in this case, it's manifestation or instance titles. So this is just showing, so we have something, so war appeared in the title for this resource, and here are the places of publication. So these are grouped um, by, you know, kind of depending on the, the level of Zoom that you're at. And it changes dynamically as you do the search. So this, so we had uh, several resources about a, a club called the Cosmos Club in Washington, DC. So it takes us, these are all going to say Washington, DC. You can also configure the, the pop-ups somewhat and provide links or additional information there. Um, so again, we'll see the, the facets. 
these these buttons at the top are kind of uh, shortcuts to isolate individual facets. Uh, now, this this doesn't display very well because of the screen size. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can open this in a different tab. Okay, so on the facet on the left for publication date, you can see you have a date slider here which shows you a distribution of publication dates which you can modify and then this might not be the best example. Let me, I, I searched for war because uh, we had a lot of um, the items that we were cataloging, this was a joint, ours was a joint project between Central Technical Services and our Rare Book and Manuscript Library Technical Services, the Beinecke Library. So they were cataloging a lot of Civil War era pamphlets. Um, and so you see the distribution here is, uh, it changes for the, the term war. We, most of the things in the 1860s, also one thing later in the 1920s. But as you change, it dynamically updates the visualization of publication places by date. Okay. Uh, also, just, just for fun, I defined another facet for height. So one of the, the nice things here is that as part of your search schema or search profile, you can define categories for literal data types. So for decimals or integers, or as you just saw, dates. So here I defined a facet for height. Um, we had extent data or uh, dimensions, rather, data in our cataloging. It did require some cleanup to, to actually um, be able to use the data type properly. But here we have a facet for, for height. And let me just, let me start over. Okay, so here's the distribution of height for resources related to the search term war. So you see it ranges from 18 to 23, and those are centimeters. And you can, again, further filter to see the results for particular values. Um, creator facet. Okay, so in addition to the map, I also have a title display which shows the actual titles and then a creator display which shows the creators and a, a count of how many, um, in this case, manifestations are associated with a creator. Okay, and there's another kind of semantic search component called structured search. And I'm going to open this in a, in a new tab. So this, is, again, is using a very similar schema to the search widgets we just saw, but it basically what this is doing is allowing you to construct a visual Sparkle query without really, um, without having to encode it. So, so you start with a, you have to define within the search schema um, domains and ranges for your categories and your, for your relations. So I have, two domains in this simple example. So I have person and I have item. Actually, let me, I had another example. Let me jump back. This is person, work, and place. Okay, so I'm, let's say I'm looking for a person. I might not know who it is, but I know that they're related to a work. And now um, I can search for the work. So. I know there's a title with cloud in it, so I'm going to select that. And it returns the, in this case, I've defined it to be the author. So it returns the author of this title, Cloud in the Honeymoon, uh, J. Palgrave Simpson. 
And you might wonder where this image is coming from. So this is getting pulled in from Wikidata. At the same time that I'm executing the search, I'm, um, I'm looking for, I'm doing a, a query against Wikidata Sparkle endpoint and bringing back any images if they're available. Okay, so person, work, so I so let me let me do that again. So I can start with a person entity, go to a work, and maybe I don't know the title of the work. So I can if I click on this button, I can take another jump because I've also defined a place entity. So I can find uh, I can ask for a person or people who are authors of a work, and a, and that work in this case I'm using the the bibframe origin place property. So that work has an origin place in let's say London. Okay, so again, I get Paul Graves Simpson. Um, let me just see if I can come up with another example. Okay. Rebellion Inexcusable by Alexander H. Stevens. Uh, I don't know where that was published. I'm not gonna do the other search. Okay, so I can also start with a work that's related to a place. Let's say Boston. So these are all of the works that have Boston as a place of origin. Now this is not the place of publication. This is actually the RDA concept of um, place of origin of work. And finally, I can do a I start with a place that's related to a work. So let's say Philadelphia. Oh, actually, this is searching for a work. So if I go back to cloud, it's going to bring me back London. Um, let me see here. Can I do anything else? I think that's basically the, the idea. And now this, this other example has person and item. So one of our main interests in our LD4P project was item level description. So especially with our, our cataloging staff at the Beinecke, we were experimenting with the, the art and rare materials ontology extension to BibFrame. And we created some profiles in the Synopia link data editor using that uh, ontology extension. So these use cases were, were important to us and um, they're ones that we're still trying to develop. So, so let's say I want to find a person related to an item um, and the, the relation I've defined here is, is marked. So a person who marked an item. So let me let me just go back there. So person actually don't our items our items don't have titles, so I, uh, I can't search for it. And I should be able to define this in a way so that the search bar doesn't pop up. Um, but I I haven't learned how to do that yet. So so I think this should work if I click on this. So this is going to look for an item that's a person who's marked an item where that item is related to a marking type. Let's see if this works. I think it was working. Okay, so this is, I know that uh, we have things that have been stamped and we recorded that. So I'm gonna choose stamp as my marking type. And okay, it looks like that one wasn't working. Let me try a different one. Item related to marking type, stamp. Okay, and that brings back the item. Let me try this again. Okay, that is working. It's not really defined correctly, but let me do it again. Person related to item. So if I put in stamp, this is gonna bring back a person who's put a stamp on an item. Um, and it's it's actually, I think these, these strings are the actual values um, or maybe the types, I, I don't recall, of the, the stamp. So these are individual stamps. In, entities basically. So if I select one, it returns uh, Falconer Madden. I believe he was a librarian at Oxford. So he has put a stamp on some item. 
he marked uh, an item with a stamp. Okay, so I hope this just gives an idea of some of the possibilities. There are more sophisticated and better implemented examples. Um, so I just jumped into a new tab here. This is from the, the vendors demo site. And this is their example of the, this structured semantic search. So you can search, this is a Wikidata example. So you can search for a person related to an organization. And then this is, this is what I was trying to do with the marking example, but I haven't quite figured out how to do it. So a person who was related to an organization and the, the relationship is educated at. So let's look for Yale. Okay, and so it brings back uh, 6,923 uh, person entities who have this educated at relationship to Yale in Wikidata. Okay, so this is a, a bit more of a more sophisticated example. Okay, back to my slides. I'm almost finishing up here. Um, okay, so I've talked about semantic search widgets, but I haven't talked about one of the, the other main features of the software, which is templating. So I, I mentioned entity-driven discovery. Templating, the templating feature is really a key way to facilitate entity-driven discovery. So you can create for any, um, any RDF type, any class in your datum that you have instance data for, you can create a template for that. And then anytime you open a link for a resource of that type, it's going to display, it's going to display it in the template that you've created. So let me, let me jump back to the search form. I'm going to search for Charles Sumner. So we have one result in person, one in work. I'm going to look at the person result. And this should open in a new tab. Oops. Uh, sorry, I think I have a last minute error that cropped up. But um, that should, let me try that again and see if I can fix the error. Okay, I have a malformed Sparkle query. Uh, let's see. So bear with me while I, I do some on the fly hacking here. Okay, I'm just gonna, I had a map embedded in this, but I'm going to, the map is causing an error. So I'm going to just take it out for now. Okay. Or maybe it wasn't the map. Uh, let me try a different person. Okay, let's go back to Simpson. Okay, well, uh, there's an error here, but it's supposed to, so this is a template for, that's applied to all person, instances of the person entity. And it's supposed to pull in, again, an image from Wikidata and a map um, with their place of birth from Wikidata. And also for, so for all person entities, this template is displaying information about works by them, any works about them, um, source data, so this is kind of, if you're familiar with cataloging interfaces, or sorry, library catalog interfaces, this is kind of the linked data equivalent of the view mark record. And then there's this knowledge graph, which I won't have time to talk about today, but is a, a pretty powerful feature of the software. So this is essentially an, an entity explorer that lets you look at your data in a relationship driven way. So I can, for the entity J. Paul Grave Simpson, I can open all of the connections. And if, if I want to, I can just expand the, the graph for that entity. Um, 
So my screen doesn't allow me to really expand this in a way that's readable, but you can you can uh, try different layouts to to make it a little bit more readable. But um, this can be really helpful, especially for expert users or for for metadata um, ec for metadata um, experts who are metadata professionals who are working with the data to kind of debug or uh, understand what's what's in the data and what the relationships are. Okay. So going back to the slideshow. Um, so templates is something that we're thinking about right now and how to how to really implement this feature, especially for the the in the Ferber model in the Ferber context, because it's challenging, as you can imagine, to to concisely display that data and render it. And it's probably something that's more easily done in a document structure using JSON or XML. Um, just doing it in Sparkle is a bit painful, but uh, should be possible. We're, we're still working on it. Um, we have a kind of a minimal template here for, we have uh, an enclosure resource, enclosure d d uh, type in our data. So this is displaying uh, an enclosure, a template for an enclosure entity, which has this list of items inside it. It's basically, you know, it's an envelope that contains a bunch of pamphlets. Um, so you can do something like this for bound widths too. We've, uh, we'll be experimenting with that use case as well. Uh, this, this example is one, one more widget. Uh, it's called the semantic tree. So I was playing with this as a possibility for explain, displaying kind of the, the full WEMI stack, the work expression manifestation item. So this uh, this is a, a a work that has two expressions, one in Chinese and one in English. Uh, the manifestation is showing the 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 title in in Chinese and in Chinese script, and then you can see that the items don't have titles. But I'll just quickly show a a feature of the software that allows you to configure labels. So preferred labels for entities. So in, if I go into the configurations, uh, I can define, because there's so much variation in our data, um, not everything is just going to have an RDFS label. So I can actually define a, a path for uh, an item to tell the system what it should select as the label for items. So I'm gonna just say to use the, the, the manifestation or instance title. So the path to that would be item of, um, so an item is an item of an instance and an instance has a title and within that title is a main title. Uh, and then I, I just format it like that and hopefully that should work. So if I refresh and go back to this slide, and reopen, you can see that the, the title has been repeated for the item. Okay, so to conclude um, with a few brief reflections based on our experience so far using this tool, as I just showed, labels are, are important. We tend to discount labels or strings, but in a search and discovery context, they're pretty important. And one of the pain points really of working with our data and with, uh, I guess, library data, bib frame data, MADS RDF authority data is that there's a proliferation of labels. And sometimes it's not always easy to get to the, the label that you want. And, in the case of a, a title, for example. So, you know, I think it would, it would behoove us to, to think more systematically about how we label things and maybe take simpler approaches where appropriate. Another reflection, entities should drive discovery. So, um, you know, I, I don't think <laughs> these are really deep reflections, but um, 
but it, it was something that was just reinforced for me um, experimenting with these search interfaces. And linked data discovery is, is self-discovery. So you, you know, you really understand the affordances of your data by querying it and trying to actually extract information and knowledge from it and construct it yourself. Or I was thinking about how to word this, but construct the graph that you want to, you know, be the graph you want to be. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, that there, you know, sometimes our data doesn't really have, it's missing kind of glue that it needs to make discovery more seamless. So, so Sparkle, one of the nice things about Sparkle is it allows you to construct or insert new triples into your data. So I did a little bit of this. So for example, I wanted to have a, a, a global agent search, so not all of our, table, our, our, sorry, our data was explicitly typed, uh, our instance data typed as, as being of the type agent. So I guess you could, you know, you could try to do this through inference or through, um, through different means, but, but I just added a triple for BF agent to, to all of our um, agent entities, and that allowed me to configure the searches a little more easily. And that's, that's kind of an, uh, uh, an obvious use, but there are other examples that might be more complex. Um, so those were my real reflections. I guess before I conclude and open it up for questions, there was uh, one other feature that I, I didn't show. Um, so another thing Metafactory has built in is a kind of a, a smart search interface. Um, a, so this is designed to be kind of a a Google-like uh, search experience, but really tailored to extract meaning from your act from the actual data and data models that you've um, loaded into the system. So this, I think, this is you know this is interesting. Um, I think it needs a lot of configuration before results are really meaningful and appropriate. But I've you know it's fun to play around with and and just playing around with it. I've found some interesting results. So, so first, let's search for stamps. And I, by stamps, what do we mean by stamps? Um, so the, again, this is using the, the entity diagram model. But if I just search for stamps, so I've, I've loaded the RBMS controlled vocabularies here. And if I just search for stamps, it's thinking that I want to see you know, this controlled vocabulary of kinds of stamps. And not you know not uh, postal stamps, but stamps they are affixed to items, and it provides this the way it's interpreted your search, and you can mo modify that um, as you go along. So let's just try one more search: items marked by Yale stamp. Okay, and this actually this actually works. If you look at the results, you probably can't see this graph and it probably wouldn't be very uh, useful for a very large result set, but it's returning all items that are held by Yale and that have, uh, that have been marked by a stamp. And if you, if you add a term stamp value, then, oh, actually I can zoom in here. There we go. So it, show, it returns the actual value for that stamp. Okay, so there's a lot more I could say about this, but I'm going to stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, that was great. Um, there are a number of questions in the Q&A, um, currently up to 15, so we um, I will jump in and start asking them. But before I do, I will apologize to all attendees that I did not realize until during the middle of this session that um, you had were not able to see the questions that came in along the way. And that same goes for the last two days, apparently. So, um, so now if you look in the Q&A, you should see the other questions that people have been asking. So, um, and there are upvotes on these questions. So I will ask the ones that have received the most upvotes first. Why was the RDA model chosen over a big frame vocabulary? Right, so we, we, did, we did use the BitFrame vocabulary. We mapped 
we mapped it onto RDA. So essentially, you know, what we added was an entity for for a super work or an RDA work. So um, because that was aligned with our current cataloging practice, that was what we chose to do. Great, thanks. Uh, you said you use Synopia for your metadata. Can MetaFactory, oh, uh, just moved. can MetaFactory manage the metadata as well? Did you look at that feature at all? Right, so we used the Synopia tool to create our metadata because that was from the beginning our, our goal with participating in the linked data for production project. But MetaFactory could be used to manage and create metadata as well. That's a feature that takes a, a, a degree of configuration. So we didn't really have the resources to, to invest in that, but it would be interesting to explore if we, I don't, we probably won't have time to do that in, you know, the next month, but it's certainly a feature that's available. Has any, has anyone done work to consider if the bib frame work instance item model is more intuitive than LRM Ferber's WEMI model? Um, I'm sure that work has been done and, you know, those, these issues have, have certainly been discussed and are being discussed, but in a discovery context, I think, you know, it still needs to be tested. And I think, I don't know, just my kind of naive um, reaction is that bib frame, there, there has to be some kind of aggregating entity for um, things like translations and expressions of a work in, in different, uh, in different, you know, in different content types. So I, I think that, yeah, I think for discovery and inevitably I find myself wanting that higher level entity. Does Metafactory stumble on blank nodes? Do you have to do any special configuration around blank nodes? Yes, so it, I'm not sure whether, I haven't actually tried to configure it to navigate blank nodes. Um, in the FAQ, it says that it can impose, you know, a, a system burden. But yeah, everything, every resource really needs to have uh, an IRI um, to really work well in the system. So, so as part of our ingest process, uh, one of my colleagues, you know, a metadata librarian um, on my team developed a workflow for, um, doing what's called scolumization, which is converting blank nodes to IRIs. So, um, so that we did have to do a good deal of post-processing and cleanup on our data, um, not necessarily to, to use it in Metafactory, but number one, just to, just to use it. Uh, but but the, the one issue, yeah, that Metafactory really required was not having blank nodes. Great. Um, what was the cost? I'm assuming the cost of the license for Metafactory in this case. Right. So I don't know. I, I don't feel that I'm really in a position to comment on the cost. Um, that could change um, based on, you know, negotiations or an individual use case. I would, I will say that, um, you know, our budget is public. So we, we paid, um, I believe it was about 38,000 for, uh, for two two licenses, so we had a um, we had first a non production license and then we upgraded to a production license so so each license was you know about um, you know half of that so thirty thirty two thousand i think actually about sixteen thousand each and but I would say that that was a significant discount for the market price for the software um, they were gracious to, to work with us um, in the context of the grant uh, because that was the budget we had available. So, so that was what it cost us. Your mileage may vary. Sounds good. <laughs> what was the learning curve like? The learning curve was, yeah, that's an interesting question. It, I, I kind of liken it to a seesaw. So on, on the one hand, there's a lot that the software does up front for you out of the box. And, 
and that's nice. But at the same time, there's a lot that it does um, for you and, and you have to kind of understand what it's doing. So a lot of the, it's very configurable. So understanding some of the internal um, configuration uh, formats is was challenging and is still challenging for me. So I would say that the learning curve is both uh, it kind of hilly, so steep, and then downhill, and then steep again. So. Great. Can authorities with cross references be loaded into the system to allow searches on variant vocabulary? Uh, yes. So, yeah. So I've loaded all of these, the LC, NAF, and LCSH, uh, MADS RDF files corresponding to the entities in our data into, into our triple store. So those labels, variant labels are and cross references are all available. Um, we haven't made full use of them, but, but I've been exploring that a little bit, just um, not, not in the authorities context, but just uh, so for in the, for the, the search example that I showed of works, I was, I'm actually searching across you know, different titles. So um, if, if I can jump back there quickly. So if I search, so there's a title, um, oops, can't see. Okay. So the, I think this is a title in um, Spanish and Chinese, but so the the expression entity has the the Romanized title. So if, although I'm retrieving the work entity, I'm I'm I've configured the search to search against all of the titles basically. So if I search for the Romanized version and use a wildcard, it it brings back the the work entity still. Okay, great. Um, if you have your eyes for entities from external sources, do you have to cache the labels in the triple store or will Metafactory pull them in, for instance, from Wikidata or idlc.gov? Yeah. So for this use case, I've, I've just pulled everything into to our triple store. It's a fairly small data set. Um, there, there are different um, Sparkle Federation features of the software and Caching it can be configured for those uh, if you want to pull in kind of live data, um, but I haven't really explored that to to any great extent. In facet search, why did you title only title key? Why did you search only title keyword? Seems like subject topic would be in there too. Yeah, yeah, it would def should definitely be fleshed out. This was really just kind of a toy example. So yeah, that was the easiest thing to configure, basically. That's why. <laughs> Sounds good. We are um, out of time in exactly one minute. And Tim, I will leave it to you to ask whether you would like to continue for a few more minutes to try to address some more questions, which will either be available to those who stay on and listen or, and or will be in the recording, or uh, would you like me to post these to Slack and to answer them there? So I'm. I mean, I'm happy to to stay a little longer um, if okay, others great. are available. I, I did want to just uh, close by saying thank you to, uh, especially to the the members of the Metafactory Working Group we have going on right now. So their names are here. Great. Um, the, if you want to leave that up, uh, we will continue on with questions for those attendees who are able to stay. Please do. Otherwise, if you need to leave, um, thank you so much for joining, and please do. Uh, consider coming to tomorrow's uh, session of the discovery track of the LD4 conference. So the next question from Laura, do you see something like this tool, which is WOW, replacing our next gen catalog uh, type old interfaces? If not, how could it work with or plug into them? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I don't feel fully in a position to answer it, but I mean, if we're if we're thinking about moving toward an kind of a knowledge graph approach, then this can really plug into 
to any, I mean, the, the, the key really is the, the data on the back end. So if you have a scalable triple store that, that can accommodate the amount of data you have, then this, you know, this, this tool can, can, can work on top of that. So um, you know, a lot of it is just really comes down to optimization and, you know, whether you can, can get the kinds of results you want out of a, a larger data set. Uh, so I guess just to answer the question more specifically, I mean, I could definitely see it um, replacing some of those interfaces, but, but at the same time, I mean, solar based interfaces like Blacklight are really have a really strong community behind them and have been thoroughly tested and, and we kind of understand them. So I think it's, I mean, and developers understand them. So I think it's going to be a challenge to m fully move away from, from them in the short term. Um, I mean, I do think that there's, there's work going on now in, in the context of LD4P to, to look about, to look at ways to, to modify or enhance uh, Blacklight with, with semantic approaches and, you know, coming back to the knowledge card idea. So, so it's really about the, the back end. Um, I, we did experiment with loading all of our share VDE data. If, if you're familiar with that project, the, the share virtual discovery environment, we loaded that into blaze graph. And so, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a, you know, I, I, I just did it kind of in a very blunt force kind of way. And it took about two weeks to load the data in, for me to load the data. So I, I could have certainly could have sped that up by parallelizing the process, but um, I did what I, what I could. Um, and yeah, that, that data set was more challenging to work with uh, because it's essentially the much larger than our current catalog. Um, I think it was about 400, mega, 400 gigabytes of data. So, um, but, but that data was also not optimized for discovery, I would say, though, in the way it was delivered. Um, so there was a lot of the kind of um, after effects of reconciliation that hadn't been removed. So a lot of the kind of the, 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 the titles that had been used for matching and reconciling entities, the, the labels that had been used to reconcile entities were, were all left in the data. So getting back to the question of labels, it was really hard to visualize the data because you know, for an entity, for a work entity that had been reconciled, you might have hundreds of labels from the different entities that had been clustered under it. Okay, so that's what I would say in response to that question. Great. Um, so you actually started, I think, in a way talking about this. You talked about the gaps or missing connections in the data. When you think about all the MARC records in a large library, there may be thousands, millions of records that aren't up to par. And those mm -hmm. connections won't magically be there after a bit frame conversion. Is this a barrier to moving forward to enhance search using tools like this? And what should libraries do? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's definitely a barrier. And I, I would say that our Synopia data after post-processing and thorough cleansing um, is pretty much as close to pristine as, as, as we, as I would expect library data, um, cataloging data to be with all of the complexity of our cataloging rules taken into consideration. So, but it has this experience, I guess, has reinforced for me the, the validity and importance of doing really substantial mass scale data cleanup and I know at this time, a lot of us uh, are looking for, for projects for, for staff who maybe um, are not able to work fully remotely. Um, and, you know, thinking about data enrichment, the data kind of semantically focused data cleanup would be really worthwhile. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is just, it would be great if we could, do a large scale um, project to add role terms to our data, you know, mark relators or um, to reconcile RDA relationship designator strings. Um, that would be a really helpful kind of thing to start with. Great. 
do you see enough potential here for a project like LD4P or a consortium like PCC to purchase a license and or support a group to do more work with Metafactory? Yeah, so yeah, again, so I'm not uh, representing them in any way, but I just to, to cite an example, so I, I didn't have time to to bring this up, but there's a, a really cool um, project, an example called Research Space, which is uh, led by the British Museum. And it's it's essentially a customization of Metafactory, the software uh, and implementation using the C-Doc CRM ontology. And the, the goal of it really is to provide a rich environment for doing uh, kind of linked data driven research, especially in museums. So it's really closely integrated with um, the International Image Op Interoperability Framework, IIIF. So if, if uh, I, I wanted to show the interface because it's, it's cool what you can do. You can um, annotate images, IIIF, using the IIIF image viewer. You can annotate and create snippets and then insert that as an entity into your data. So um, that project is a community driven project and it's kind of a hybrid model. So it's, they're working with the vendor Metafax to cr customize the software and it's, and they have kind of a hybrid funding model. So it's all free. It's the software is still not open source, um, but it is free. So that's a potential model to look at. Uh, I do think there's potential for something like that with uh, maybe with the PCC um, to look into. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, those are discussions that, that, uh, that I'm not involved in right now. Great. So regarding labels and synonyms, perhaps a thesaurus of labels would be helpful, question mark. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, something like that might be helpful. Yeah, just to kind of understand the, the landscape and come up with a mapping, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think you may have answered this question earlier. I, sh I believe that you did, but just but in case. Um, did you manually catalog the entities into Metafactory or was the information pulled directly from your catalog? Uh, this was all, uh, this was, all of the data was manually created in the Synopia link data editor. How does the query builder compare to the native Wikidata query builder? besides not requiring the user to know Sparkle. Yeah, well, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big uh, plus. Um, but I, I, I I've, haven't used the Wikidata Query Builder extensively, so I can't really comment fully on that. But uh, if I think you, you're ref this question is referring to the, the semantics, the structured search widget. Um, so that's really, yeah, it's not requiring you to to know really anything about the properties or the the data, the instance data or the the classes and properties in your data model. So it's really just for an end user, a kind of um, you know end user who is may not be may not have a domain knowledge of your model. Great. Um, the, meta, the way Metafactory interprets natural language queries is intriguing. How much does a user need to know to make use of this? Does applying alternative labels to a property class, et cetera, help? And can a query string be derived from a Sparkle search? Can a query string be derived from a Sparkle search? Um, I'm not sure about, the, about that particular interface, but I would say to the, the first part of the question that uh, I, in my experience, you would really need to know a lot. This is really the, the graph scope natural language search is something that is really for expert users, I would say, because the results can be kind of frustrating if you're not intimately familiar with the data model. Um, it is very configurable and customizable. so. There's an extensive set of configurations you can apply to ignore certain properties because you, it has to index your data and it does kind of a graph um, 
it applies graph analytics to the to the data set to look for shortest paths between entities and does all kinds of things um, under the hood so so you can configure which classes which properties you want to include or ignore um, so i think really spending some time and probably it would probably require consulting with the vendor to really get it fine-tuned um, but applying yeah so alternative labels things like that could can be potentially helpful but um, it's a bit of a black box so it's can be hard to know great and uh one more question that i am going to merge to uh the first of which is already answered but did you um did you import your data from Sinopia into Metafactory or did you connect Metafactory live into Sinopia via something like an endpoint? No, so we didn't, theoretically it could be possible, but um, we, we exported our data from Sinopia and, and ingested it into BlazeGraph to, um, to work with in Metafactory. Great, thank you. And there's one final comment in the Q&A, which is thank you so much for your outstanding presentation. And I cannot say it any better than Brenda just did. Thank you so much, Tim, for your for your presentation today. This was wonderful. Um, and I appreciate not only the amount of effort that and time that you put into presenting and demoing this for us, but also staying longer to continue to answer all these questions. Um, with that, I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Please do not hesitate to join tomorrow for the last session of the discovery track. And with that, I will say farewell to all. Take care. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody.